Hi, I'm Michael from Lyric Hi-Fi. Uh, we've got a couple of very special videos. This is an intro to uh, an interview that I've just done. Just back from a very special launch at KEF of the new Blade 2 Meta and KEF Reference Meta. But this is over to Jack Ockley Brown, Doctor. Professor Dr. Jack Ockley Brown and uh, David Bosch. Don't think he's a professor, but he's a good guy. And this is talking about how you get to be a senior design engineer at the world's leading loudspeaker design facility. Over to the guys. Okay, so uh, I'm here in a hotel in somewhere in deepest Kent at a secret launch of some new Kev products and to avoid crowds we're hiding in a bathroom <laughs> and it's where we've, people aren't allowed to know about this, it's all top secret. Uh, the rest of the video will tell us about the products, but this is even more impressive than the products. Beside me here, I've got two guys that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, on the right is Jack Ockley Brown, and he is actually very well known because he has presented lots of uh, products that have been groundbreaking and basically rewritten some of the rules of making loudspeakers. The other chap you won't know, but he is a lead a design engineer and research engineer at KEF called David Bosch and I've only met him earlier. He's a very interesting chap with an interesting history. For Irish people watching this, he is a fanatic about the Titanic. Um, doesn't make him a bad person, does it? That's fine. So, um, Jack, how, um, how did you come to be at KEF and what had you been doing just before that? Okay, I, I've told this story before. Tell a short well, version then. I wanted to design loudspeakers as a career. I've always wanted to do that. I don't know why, but I've always wanted to do that. And when I was studying at Southampton University, uh, I decided instead of going and doing a summer job picking fruit or something like that, I'd try and get an internship at a loudspeaker company. Can I just pause you? That's the difference between Jack and me. I did go and pick fruit <laughs> and work in a, a farm in Essex, just not far from here, yeah, canning I've, peas, I've whereas he, he was doing important stuff. I've done that as well, and that's why I knew I didn't want to do it again. <laughs> I only did it once. <laughs> yeah. I wrote letters to lots and lots and lots of loud speaker companies. And there's a lot in the UK, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I got one reply. Right. Kef. Right, okay. <laughs> I got an internship in 2002. Yeah. And then uh, they said at the end of the three months, do you want to come back next summer? So of course I want to come back next summer. And then when I graduated in 2004, I phoned them up and said, I've graduated. Can I work for you? And yeah, I've been there ever since. It, isn't it wonderful how some things happen by accident? Which, which brings me to you, David, because you had an accidental ending up here I mean, by a path... Well, listening to Jack, it's kind of weird that my story is not so di no, not so different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also, since I was a child, maybe 10, 11, always wanted to make speakers. I was an audio fan, but particularly speakers. There was something, um, something about them and listening to them and building them and reading about them. And I was in Mexico, I grew up in Mexico, and mm -hmm. there's not really many chances to make speakers unless you make your own business and start from scratch and maybe sell to friends. Um, so it took me a while to find a way to find this path, and it wasn't until I'd been working in the automotive industry for some years mm -hmm. that I decided, well, I do want to make a, a master's in acoustical engineering, and I found many programs, one of which was in Southampton, where Jack studied as well, mm -hmm. and it took me a couple of years to get a scholarship, because it, it was very expensive. Um, I got a scholarship from the UK, got to the UK, and it just sort of um, happened really organically. Um, I also sent an email to every speaker company I knew of. Um, I remember sending an email to the hello at kev.com, and instead of someone from the office replying, it was Jack directly. And it was like, hey, send me, send me your, whatever you've been working on and your CV. And why, why do you come and visit us? Uh, we'll pay for your train. And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah, of course. So I went there, I think it was a Friday. Um, we spent around three hours. And you, you were very generous with your time. And I felt like I connected with what you guys were doing. And, that evolved into doing my dissertation project with them. And then Jack was, why don't you make it with us 
as a summer internship, moved to Maidstone during the summer, uh -huh. and and did that. And okay. eventually, I was really lucky that a, a place opened, and I am now part of the team. Okay, that just happened like that. So we've got two people here who both were. Uh, born to be loudspeaker designers and we're both interested in being loudspeaker designers. So um, it's interesting how anybody, uh, everyone ends up doing what they're good at somehow or hopefully end up what they're, they're good at. But can I just uh, pull this back a wee bit and go, right, well, you're both science, very science-based. And I know that a lot of loudspeaker manufacturers have some... Uh, the uh, crackpot theory so that I think sometimes but you're very engineering based and I know that in a lot of your project, projects you then published white papers which um, a geek like me finds fascinating I've actually read I don't know all of them but quite, quite a few of them but Jack what's the difference between you and other manufacturers because other manufacturers don't do this. They don't yeah, publish I, the, the scientific facts of what's going on. Yeah I always um, say if you, if you took a a very, very long lineup of all the loudspeaker companies that there are, and you put them in the kind of order of the ones who think a loudspeaker is an instrument yes. or an artistic piece. Yes. And you put them down one end, and you to say, well, who in the people who think loudspeaker companies who think that this is, you know, a, a transducer, this is, you know, a, an engineering instrument, and yeah. we're up, right up that end. We, you know, we, we think the way you make a loudspeaker better is by understanding the science and the physics yeah. of how it's making sound. Yeah. And the more deeply you can understand that and unravel it, then the better you can improve it. And I think that's clear for us, you know, yeah. very clear. And although, although the experience of listening to, you know, the end result and enjoying the music is completely unscientific and purely emotional. Yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, one of, of you know, enjoyment and the, or, or relaxation or something at least, the process should be scientific. But then what about the publishing of that information? Well, that's something that we feel is kind of obligatory, really, because I think it's extremely difficult for uh, the public to understand a company if you don't put out there, you know, what yeah. you're really about, you know, yeah. the essence of how you do something. So if we're, you know, working on something incredibly detailed in the driver, but we don't tell anyone about that. And how does somebody come to learn, you know, about how we approach things? So I, I think it's utterly important that we try and give people an insight into how we engineer the drivers and the loudspeakers so that the white papers are for that. Okay, so you, you publish this white paper, David. You've done all this work. You put this information out there, which is gold. And you look at what other manufacturers do, you've given the information to help them, and you look at their product and think, what a load of rubbish. What do you, th what do you, what do you think when people, are they disagreeing with you? Or, or what, what's, go what's going on there? We don't, we don't necessarily publish a white paper for everyone to do exactly the same. No, but it must make them think. I'm pretty sure, I mean, uh, one way I, I learned about um, the science of large speakers was through reading all manufacturers' white papers, okay. and and also scientific papers, and um, I'm sure it makes many people think about how things are done, and most importantly, where's the opportunity for improvement? Um, well, they put it into practice. I'm sure that's a more complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a lot more to the entire design, and the someone's design maybe from a completely different starting point mm, that they have yeah. they have to follow but I think it's always impressive that at KEF you are starting from a scientific point not the instrument point for yes, example yes, um, I, I agree with you I mean uh, uh, an instrument can be made to sound in a perfect in a different way mm -hmm. and so uh, beside where, where we are in Belfast there's a very famous guitar maker called George Lydon mm -hmm. and the sound of his instrument is fantastic but the job of the loudspeaker is not to add a sound like George Lydon it is to exactly reproduce yeah, yes, what exactly. George Lydon yes, does exactly. okay so do you look at what other manufacturers do? Oh, of course yeah what do you think? And I'm sure they look at what we do. Of course. And, 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 and some things we look at and we think we 
No, we wouldn't do it like that. But you know, you see gems as well. You see great engineering, great yeah. designs as well. Yeah. And and as much as you know, I talk about this lineup. It's not like I'm sneering. No, it's no. just a different approach. Yes. it's just a, you know, and and there are some speakers which are designed as instruments, and you know, on a piece of music that that you know enhancement from that approach suits you can have these unbelievable reproduction experiences yeah. but you know we're trying to make something which is like a, a precision instrument that works reliably across lots of different genres in different situations yes. and rooms. I, and also have a program of development where we know how to make something better and we can have you know year one as a launch and year two a launch yeah. and, and and I don't know how you do that without a scientific structure to yes. what they're doing. Yes. If every morning you're just going in, listening and trying stuff out, yeah. I don't know how you know what you're going to be doing in 10 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever you've got these ideas, David, and you've talked about these ideas, the next stage is making that idea something you can actually make. The productionizing of your ideas, the the, make, the the difference between the design idea and the engineering to turn it into a finished product. Yeah. How how difficult is that, or how constraining can that be? It's um, it's certainly a long process that involves um, many teams that support us. How, how many people would be? Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of different teams in different several dozens. Um, yeah. Yes, many teams in many places, at least in Mason with several engineers. We have a design office, um, we have software engineers, um, and together we all design either components or, or parts of the software that we'll use to simulate a um, okay. speaker. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is a process of also discovery and a process of development, de developing a loudspeaker for production. One thing is to make a prototype and make it sound the best you can. Another thing is for that to make sense as a product in the market, something that can be manufactured, something that will pass the most difficult tests, mm -hmm. uh, that will pass thermal tests, electrical tests, that will uh, be reliable, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, um, yeah, it is. Okay. I think, I think in the, uh, I mean, I saw you encounter it on day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you're always, I mean, especially with simulation. In simulation, you can do whatever you like. So yeah. it's quite easy to, you know, have something working on the computer yeah. and not know how to make it. Yeah. It's very, very easy to do. And, and so you are very constrained there yeah. by, you know, manufacturing restrictions or just yeah. practical restrictions. Of, yeah. You know, a typical one would be how small we can make things and still assemble them, or mm -hmm. and how, how thin you can make something without it being too delicate. Yeah. And yeah. yeah so you, you're encountering this all, all the time, yeah. or, or trying to find new processes yeah. that can deliver something yeah. different. So. The, um, the the speakers we've listened to today have been the top of the range, the reference, the blades. I'm not saying it's an unlimited budget, but it's a pretty pretty high budget for making speakers that are £30,000 a pair plus, which is an enormous amount of money. And I, I, I must admit, I, I think I must give you great pleasure and a great smile to be able to design something like that almost without limits. But whenever you come down from that, the reference series is still fantastic. The R series, I love it. It's wonderful. The Q series, the Q series for lots of people is still an expensive proposition, but you're constrained massively with price of that. Mm -hmm. the, the different set of problems you have there, is that more challenging? I think it's actually part of the interesting thing, uh, thing of engineering projects more constrained. If anything, you have to come up with better solutions to so that the ethos of our um, design trickles down to the least expensive product, that we can still deliver a proposition that makes sense, that sounds uh, good, mm -hmm. and it always, it all obviously will be limited and compromised. But I'm sure we will be very creative to be able to mm -hmm. deliver that. Yeah, I always say to people, you know, people might be interested in buying a 
uh, a pair of uh, Q series speakers, 400 pounds, 500 pounds, product of the year at 500 pounds. But you look at that in, in my store and you go, that would not have been possible without those blade mm. twos that sit over in the corner at 20,000 pounds. Yeah. But was that ethos and that knowledge is reused yes. uh, uh, and taken into account again and again. I think the thing with a, a, a very constrained budget is you have to really know where to spend the money. Yeah. Um, on, on something like Blade and Reference, we're in a great position because we're really trying to get the optimal from every single component and we've got the budget to do that. But when you talk about you know, a, a Q350, yeah. then where should we put the money? Yeah. Which bits or is it worth adding a little bit more on and if you're going to do that where do you make the saving elsewhere so that's the challenge that, that you don't have on the high end that's that's actually yeah in a way more difficult yeah. to, to pick the right compromises yeah. okay one more thing because we've talked for a while so today well it's not actually launched for another three weeks but whenever this video comes out these guys would have been responsible for Possibly, in my opinion, one of the finest, if not the finest, loudspeakers money can buy. But certainly up there in, in a top small, small number. What are you going to do when you go back to work? And <laughs> what, do you start all over again? How far are you down the line? What's the life of this engineering team now? Just like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the next week off now. Or what, what are you going to do on Monday morning when we're, you go back from this? Well, this is already behind us. This is, I mean... It's it's in production now. It's already been in production for for um, you know many weeks. Uh, before it got to that point, all the design had to be signed off quite a lot of weeks before that. Okay. You know, and and the programs are kept of different lengths anyway. So even concurrently with developing this range, we were, there's other speakers. Mm -hmm. You know, having to have our attention at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Active speakers for you know other. Mm -hmm other things, things coming out later in the year and things that won't come out for two or three years. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, listen, I'm, I, I, I know and I'm sure that uh, we will see fantastic new products from you guys in the very near future. But for now, Jack Offley Brown, David Bosch, thank, thank you both very much for giving us that insight into uh, what nerdy madmen <laughs> in an engineering design department actually sound like. So thank you very much. Well, thanks. thanks. So I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed talking to them. Fascinating guys. Uh, if you did like it, then like it and subscribe and do all that. That's all free. And um, we'll see you on the next one. There's another video with this, which is about the actual product. So hopefully you'll watch both of them. Thanks for watching.